while you're turning there, um, if you are passing out some flyers, if you'd tell your team leader, and there's five different leaders, you should be able to find somebody on that team. Um, when you get them in, send a text to them or whatever. Um, and we'll get the word out. Talk. Send me a text. I'll figure out how to how to get word because we are keeping track. And this fall program for six weeks, we just want to push a little more, do a little extra, and try and get the word of God out, invitations to church out. And then, of course, our last Sunday of the fall program is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And we're going to be having services scattered around the community. Our goal is to bring in lots and lots of groceries so that we can go to an area and say we're going to have a service out here in this park and we're going to have groceries and turkeys and we're going to have a Thanksgiving service and we'll invite people. It's easy to get from your apartment to a park right next door. Uh, a lot more difficult to get people to church. So we're going to bring church to them and we do this over and over and there'll be, there'll be thousands of people hear the gospel. And so if you'd start now, there's, there's uh, garbage cans that are food dispensaries, or I don't know what you want to call it. Anyway, they're garbage cans, but put food in them, not garbage. And uh, on each side of the foyer and in the, in the Sunday bulletin, uh, there's your list on the wall of what we want, Rachel. On the windows there, there's things taped, what kind of food we want. Just buy anything you can that, that's on that list. And if you can get a whole bag, bring it, a complete bag, tied and set it in there. That is really great. If you bring a turkey, do not put it in the garbage can. And, you know, that seems ridiculous to say that, but that has happened over the years. We've had many a turkey sit in the garbage can from Sunday night until Wednesday or Thursday when it started to smell. And anyway, so... If you have a turkey, bring it by the church office or get it to an usher, somebody that will bring it up and put it in the, in the freezers in the kitchen. All right, Galatians chapter 2 in your Bible. Galatians chapter 2. And, uh, boy, these churches, thank God for Justin Lehman and young men like him that keep by the stuff and they don't throw in the towel and they don't turn their church into a nightclub or a rock concert or a party. Instead, they turn it into a place, uh, the house of God, the people of God. Galatians chapter 2. And just follow along. We're going to start down about verse 4. And we're not going through the book of Galatians verse by verse. We're taking a couple of themes out of the book of Galatians. We started a couple of weeks in the importance of studying. We've got to be people who study the Bible. Uh, I am for a teenager reading the book of Proverbs, a chapter a day. Today's the 25th. Read Proverbs 25. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with a young Christian reading a chapter in Matthew and another chapter in Mark or whatever, or opening the Bible up and reading a few verses wherever. Thank God for that. But you that have been saved for a while, it's time we grow. It says that um, when for the time we ought to be teachers, we have need that one teach us again, which be the first principles of the oracles of Christ, and uh, that, you, that you're not able to handle meat, but babes need the milk of the word. And there's nothing wrong with the milk of the word, but I'll tell you, if I could have a glass of cold milk or a steak and a baked potato, I'm not going to have to think very long. And we ought to be getting more steak and baked potatoes out of the word of God. And I want to encourage you, get used to it. Don't get, uh, don't get where the word of God becomes a complacent thing or a casual thing. So anyway, we're just picking a few things up in this matter of studying. If you look at verse 4 of chapter 2, and because that, now again, Paul's writing to the churches in Galatia, and that's the area under the Black Sea. They're not Jewish people, although Jews have immigrated everywhere. But uh, verse 4, and that because of false brethren... Now, right off, we got some false brethren. There are people that come into the church that appear to be brethren. Paul called them false brethren who came in unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in, G in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, the subject here is moving people from liberty to bondage. And people will use that idea, stand fast or for, in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, he says in a little bit, we'll see it. And people say, see, you don't need a church with a bunch of do's and don'ts. No, no. From the Garden of Eden, there were do's and don'ts. You had two perfect people and they had a rule. Don't eat from that tree. And when they broke that rule, he gave them ten. And when they, he broke that, they broke those, all ten of them. The next day, Paul broke, or P Paul broke them. Moses broke them. He broke them, threw the rocks down. But anyway, when they, when they uh, messed those up, you have the Levitical law. 
somebody said 600 laws. Somebody else said it. I don't know how many laws. I know this. I'm not counting them. You go, you go through and count all the laws in Leviticus if you want. But, but um, Christianity and, and our faith, it's not a lack of holy living. But you'll see here when he talks about bondage at the end of verse 4, that bondage has, has to do with being saved by grace. So we are free from a life of rigid laws trying to find a way to get saved. And we, are, we're, we don't want to get bound. We're free. We don't want to be bound. We don't want to go back to people having to keep uh, uh, holy days and Sabbaths and new moons and all these things. And you'll see that. But that's what we're going to focus on tonight. Verse 6, or verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the what? The gospel might continue with you. So what's the subject we're talking about here? It's the gospel. So in verse 4, when he says these false brethren, they came in, and the, these false brethren came into the church, and they're saying, you know, I understand you got saved, but you've got to keep the law. And you've got to follow the Old Testament commandments. You've got to keep the commandments of Moses or you're not really saved. And they're trying to bring people who came to Christ by faith, trusting the blood of Christ as full atonement for their sins. And they're trying to drag those people over and bring them back into bondage. And Paul said, we didn't put up with them for a minute that we might protect the gospel. That's the issue here. And some years ago, one of our, I almost called her name, but I don't want to embarrass whoever she got it from, family, it might have been somebody close, but um, someone gave me a kid's um, uh, message, a CD message, and it was very well done and uh, interesting, and it was about the judgment seat. And, and these two people were at the judgment seat, and for one, they got the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne seat judgment mixed up, but, but someone got to the judgment seat, and they just basically had not lived a good enough life. Yeah, as a child, they'd made a profession, and yes, they'd been baptized, they went to church, but they did not live it. And they went to hell. Now, that is what Galatians is being written about. And let's follow through as we'll look at this. You see, in verse 5, he says, we didn't give subjection to these, didn't give, we didn't give place by subjection to these, not even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue. The subject of the book of Galatians is the word, the gospel. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of the gospels, though we call them gospels, the word gospel means good news. And though the gospels bring us good news, the actual word gospel only appears three to six times per gospel. In the book of Acts, the, the word gospel, and, and Romans and Corinthians, the, book of, uh, the word gospel only appears at, uh, the most six times in any book. I mean, Matthew, 28 chapters, these big books, 1 Corinthians, all this huge book of 1 Corinthians, and yet six times in the first chapter of Galatians, the gospel is mentioned. The, you can tell the theme of a chapter or the theme of a book by repetition. God knows we're dense. And as you study through a book, read it and read it and read it. And you'll see things starting to pop out at you. And you see repetition. The just shall live by faith. You read about Stephen. You see over and over and over. It says, um, it, um, not of Stephen, Stephen's sermon about Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph and Joseph prospered. You see that in the book of Genesis several times. You see it in the book of Acts. And so that's that's the theme of Joseph's life. The Lord was with Joseph and Joseph prospered. You ought to always be looking for repetition. The, the word gospel is in the book of Galatians more than any five other books, I think, if I were to do the math all right. And again, I didn't write it all down. I was going through studying it and just it, numbers don't stick in my head. I do know I have one wife and I'm, I'm sure of that. Verse, uh, let's go down. And so he... Um, he, he's, we're skipping down to, to verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, now again, Antioch is over on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, here's Israel. Way up here is Galatia. Antioch's here on the coast. Now he's illustrating the issue of the gospel. Anytime you're going to teach a truth, you teach the truth, the facts of the truth, and then you try and illustrate it so it makes sense to people. You guys in my preaching class know about illustrations. So he's going to give us an illustration. Look at verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, 
I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He was certainly not the first and only sinless pope, nor was any other pope sinless. But Paul just withstood him to the face publicly. He was to be blamed, verse 12. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Remember, there's Jews and Gentiles. And he, he was normally, he, they, Antioch's a Gentile city. And they had a great church there. Antioch's where they were first called Christians. And it was a wonderful place and a great church. Um, and so Peter's there. And they're teaching the word of God and people being saved. And they're enjoying the fellowship of Jew and Gentile together. Well, some Jews came from uh, Jerusalem and from the big church and they showed up and all of a sudden Peter got worried oh no what are they gonna say I'm eating with Gentiles now you can't even fathom that because in our culture who's in this room we don't even know who's in this room my goodness we're a mixed multitude America is a great country to me one of the neatest things about America is that we're Americans you know in Germany they're Germans Austria they're Australians not really Austrians and uh, in the Philippines, almost everybody's Filipino, and uh, but but you come to America, there is no place quite as diverse as America. Although Vancouver sure got a good, if you've never been there, they've got a pretty good run at it as well. But but America being built around a philosophy and I, an ideal rather than a, a a genetic people, and so but these Jews, they, remember we talked about it before, they struggled with this thing that God could even save a Gentile. Remember in John chapter four. Jesus comes to the well and he's waiting and the woman comes. She's a Samaritan, half Jew, half Gentile. And he's waiting. He says, could I have a drink? And she says, who are you a Jew? Ask and drink of me that I'm a Samaritan. For the Jews and the Samaritans had no dealing with one another. The Jews were a very, very narrow people. They wanted no fellowship with anybody. And when Jesus let the gospel get to the world, that was a massive mental, spiritual, and social adjustment for them. And so here, even though the church had been going for some years and people had been saved in the Gentile community and in the, in the Jewish community, here, Peter is in verse 12, certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, or the Jews. Verse 13, and other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation and so here they are the Gentile Christians the Jewish Christians Barnabas and Paul and Peter and all the people in this is a wonderful church there in Antioch and uh, and then these Jews come walking in from Jerusalem and man Peter saw him out the window or I don't know how he saw him at it and he jumped up and ran away from the table because the Jews had needed a table there and the Gentiles had needed a table there and well as soon as Paul got up and ran with Barnabas thought well have you ever seen somebody else do something and you and you ran you went along with them and you knew it was stupid but you did it anyway you've never done that probably yeah you have and uh, that's why teenagers you be careful who you hang with and that's why adults you be careful who you hang with how many stupid things has a teenager, a young adult, or a college-age guy or girl done simply because your ridiculous, immoral, uh, vulgar, lewd friends did this corrupt thing, and you're in it, and it's like jumping over a waterfall, you're going on into foolishness, um, guard your TV, guard your books, guard your friends, but here, even among Christians, these things happen, and so Peter goes away, Barnabas goes away with him, and Paul steps back, here's the Christian's from Jerusalem, the Jews. Here's the Christians from Antioch, these Gentile Christians, and probably a whole big mixture of them. And in verse 13, uh, Paul steps up, and is he ever mad? I'm sorry, verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the what? The gospel. I said unto Peter before them all. Let me stop for a minute. This warm and fuzzy Let's always be gracious kind of thing. Um, you know, years ago I met with the staff. I'll never forget it. Uh, I, am the, I am not a confrontational person. I don't like conflict. Uh, I'd rather say something to a group than to you individually. And I hope you don't have rocks for brains and I hope you'll catch it and fix it. And sometimes people don't. I just hate to confront someone one on one. But I met with the staff some years ago, many years ago. And, there were, and I said, look. I love you. We work well together. The church is being blessed. You've got to allow me the liberty 
to correct you. And if I correct you, get the chip off your shoulder. Don't cry. Don't pout. We're big people here. We've got a church to build. We've got a gospel to preach. And, and it's like the next day, something came up, and I went to someone, and I said, That's, that cannot happen here. I was very kind. I was not, not harsh at all. I said, you were wrong. And uh, you were out of line. That's their area. That's not your area. And, this, and you leave them alone. And that day they walked out and they've not been back at church since. That was a staff member. I, I hate conflict. I hate it even more when quality staff members pout out. But the fact is, leadership sometimes has to do that stuff. And it's a reality. And uh, don't fall apart at the seams when it happens. I have two planned this week. And <laughs> but you know what? Two years, I can get Social Security. <laughs> and that'll get me about a quarter of my pay. And so anyway, I'm not going anywhere, I promise. Until you fire me, I'm here. But Peter rebuked, Paul rebuked Peter in front of everybody. Hey, Peter, you can't do that. Now, the issue here. What's the whole subject we've been talking about? The gospel, right? And the gospel is how you get your sins forgiven. The gospel is not how you become a Baptist or how you uh, become an American. The gospel is how a sinful man on his way to hell can have his sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and I can be born into the family of God and I can freely receive the gift of grace. That's the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again. That's it. Nothing to do with church, nothing to do with baptism, nothing to do with being a good guy or giving up this or not doing that anymore. The gospel is that Jesus saves sinners. But what we were looking at here is an illustration of how we can get messed up. Now watch this in verse 15, uh, the end of the rest of verse 14. Peter, Paul is chewing out Peter in front of everybody. If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and look at this phrase, and not sinners of the Gentiles. It's like they're this holy little group of people, aren't they something? Uh, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So again, he comes back in verse 16. What are we talking about? You're justified by faith. Um, here, Peter uh, backs away from the table from eating because he felt like being justified required all these Old Testament rituals. This has nothing to do with liquor. As wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. It has nothing to do with living a holy life. It has nothing to do with 1 John, come out from among them and be a separate, say it there, 1 Corinthians, set, be a separate, say it the Lord. Separation from unholy living is one thing, but we don't want to get this thing ever mixed up with the gospel. Now what you'll hear in churches, when someone will hear someone like us talk about holiness, by the way, holiness and sanctification are about the same word, and it's all through the New Testament. I got married a long time ago. I don't know how long, but anyway, a long time ago, um, 36 years ago or so, and um, I was sanctified. That word means set apart. I was set apart from all the other women in the world to one woman. That is holiness. It's the most practical, simple illustration of holiness. Holiness means I have been set apart from all the women that chased me, which was zero. <laughs> But there was liberty if they'd have wanted to. <laughs> I have now been set apart unto another, and I am no longer on the market. That is the word holiness. That's the word sanctify. I have been set apart. And so I was once lost, and I was in this messed up world of sin and shame, and this world of lying and deceit and drugs and liquor and arrogance and, uh, and selfishness and greed and lust and all the works of the flesh that Galatians talks about. We'll see it in another week or two. And when I got saved, I became his. And I ought to turn my back on all the garbage of this world, just like I ought to turn my back on every other lady in this world. That's, that, that's the word separation. It has nothing to do with being saved. It just has to do with I belong to a new master. 
I belong to him. You'll see this. Stick with me in the next couple of weeks and we'll get through these next few chapters. But let's keep reading there in verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We are justified by faith. Even we have, what's the next word? Believed. John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, by the works of the law, shall no flesh be justified. And all this, he starts out in a progression, explaining the doctrine of salvation, and that it has nothing to do, don't be bringing us into bondage to the law. And then he brings in this illustration of Peter thinking he can't eat with some Jewish, with some non-Jewish believers. Look, it's worse to eat with an unsaved Jew when you're a saved Jew than to eat with a saved non-Jew. Figure this thing out. Christian people are the ones who ought to be dear to. And then he goes right back into Bible doctrine. He teaches the doctrinal truth, he illustrates it, and then he brings it back. The story of Peter separating from the Gentiles was Peter's mind reflecting back that I can't please God, I can't be saved if I am hanging around Gentile people. And this whole thing, he goes back there in verse 16 and 17. We are saved by faith, we're justified by faith, by believing. Verse 17, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, now watch, this is where we are in our churches in America. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Now, what's he talking about in the story here? He's not talking about you got a bad attitude. You got up late. You didn't get your Starbucks. You know, you wanted a macchiato with three shots of something in it. I have no idea. I don't drink coffee and I don't go to Starbucks for sure. They don't even make good pastry at Starbucks. But your order didn't come out right. Uh, you know, you went to a restaurant and ordered water and they gave you city water. <laughs> Worse yet, Elsinore city water. <laughs> we'll go to a restaurant and Mrs. Goddard will order water being Miss Healthy. And she'll take one sip and say, yuck, this is city water. My diet Pepsi is more healthy than her city water. <laughs> guaranteed. And it always tastes the same as long as you stay in America. You go overseas, they mess with it. He says... This, this thing about being a sinner, being the sinner, he's talking about getting mixed up with keeping the law. He said, while we say we are getting saved by faith, if we're reaching over there and we're trying to keep the law as our justification, we're messing things up. And we have countless churches in America today, and they are supposedly gospel preaching churches. And they have, uh, and, and by the way, they're the, they're the most worldly churches you'll ever find. And they will tell you, you get saved by trust in Jesus. They might sometimes even baptize you by immersion. Maybe once a year they'll go to the ocean and baptize or whatever. But then the very next thing they'll say is, but if, but if you are not good, you're not really saved. Well, you know what? You're either saved or you're not. You're not really saved. You're either lost or you're not. You know what? You can't be really lost. You're lost or you're saved. It's in the subject. There's no in between. That's like, you know, I go into the morgue and they pull up to the body and they say, this guy, he's dead. Well, look over here. He pull this one out. This guy's really dead. <laughs> dead is dead, folks. Dead in trespasses and sin. If you've not been born again, you're dead. You're dead. You're on your way to hell. You can be born again by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and you will be alive. And there is a split second and less than a split second from the moment you believe you are instantly born into the family of God, forgiven, reconciled, justified, name written in the book of life. Somebody said there's 42 things happen the moment you believe. I have no idea. I'm not going to sit around and th split hairs on that, but I know this. It's a good thing to be saved. And so he says there in verse 17, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. We're trying to gather up this, this holiness you're trying to create, Peter, by separating from the Jews. What's wrong with you here? Verse 18, for if I build again the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What did Paul destroy? Paul, when Paul, Paul spent his whole life as a, as a Pharisee, preaching the law, keep the law, obey the law, writing it out, memorizing it, 
and one day he said, I am done with the law. Christ is the end of the law for, for, for uh, forgiveness of sin. I am done with all that thing. And Paul threw all that thing away. And he said, I count it all but dung. It's all gone. And it's all about Jesus and faith. And this whole thing, uh, Paul said, if I build again in verse 18, the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And you'll see again and again in Galatians, either you're going to get saved by works or you're going to get saved by faith, and there cannot be any blurring of this. There's some wonderful Adventist people, Seventh-day Adventists, but the Adventist people have confused grace and works so much, they don't know if they're saved. In fact, they've gone down to the point in their, in their doctrine, if you, you talk to an Adventist that knows their doctrine, that when they die, their soul and body lie in a, in a in state, in, a, in the grave, and it'll stay there until the judgment day. And on the judgment day, their soul comes out, and, and then Jesus decides whether they've been good enough. We know what, when they died, he knew whether they were good enough. They're all confused. But they're trying to figure out if their works were worky enough. And their faith was faithy enough. And no one can say, I know I'm saved. That is the saddest thing. Man, I, I, I just don't know anything any more wonderful than I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I'm saved. I love the little four, five, six, eight-year-old child in one of our Sunday school classes can hear the story of the gospel that Jesus loves them and they can bow their head and put their faith in Christ and he will save them because Jesus said suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such of them is the kingdom another time he said to the adults if you don't get converted and become like little children you're gonna perish it's not kids who need to become educated like adults it's adults who need to become simple and trusting like children that's what salvation's all about. And let's look down there um, in verse 20. I'm going to point out uh, one word. It's three times. If you're right, right in your Bible, it has nothing to do with this thing. But it's a little, a little word, the word of. Look at verse 20 at the end of it. Uh, now I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, if you've got anything but a King James, it's a good chance. About half the other Bibles change that word of to the word in. Now that's a key thing there because faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus are light years apart. And that's one way you can identify some of these corrupt versions of the Bible. It's not a King James, it's corrupt. And the, that, the, the readers are not corrupt. The writers are corrupt. I mean, the reader, if a person's got the wrong version of a Bible, they got a Bible. My goodness, they're trying you know, I remember when Brother Steve Sandberg and his wife Sharon and their kids started coming to our church and they picked up a track on the New King James. My first day at his house, I'm sitting there and, and he said, this track, it's by the, and I don't know how that track got on our table, but it was, it was right, but it was a little rough. And he said, this track's in the New King James. I said, yeah, it is. And he said, uh, my wife reads a New King James. <laughs> I said, well, you know what Jesus said? If anyone will seek me, they'll find me. I said, just have her keep reading it. She'll figure it out. I'm not going to, it's not, they were in sincerity. Now, he wasn't reading the New King James because he was the man that was right. But those women are a little slow sometimes catching on. But I have no idea what he was reading. I don't know. But, but I do know this. Um, the, the seed of corruption is sown in this book if you're not careful. And that's why we've got to stick with the word of God and be so careful. But if you look at that word of in verse 20, go back up to the word to verse 16 knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith, what? Of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in, so we've believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The subject all through here is not holiness. The subject is, is salvation there is a subject that is how do you get saved 
Do you get saved by being good, or do you get saved by, by faith in Jesus Christ? Or, and then there's the subject of separation and sanctification and just basic holy living. I shouldn't steal and kill and rob, and I should live a holy life. My life should be a picture of holiness. 1 Peter 1.15 says, Be therefore holy as I am holy. Uh, he's quoting Leviticus. Uh, we ought to live a holy life. We shouldn't try to get so worldly. You know, how bad can I be and still be saved? Well, you know what? I don't know. I think saved people are saved. Last time I checked, you're just a sorry Christian. But you're still saved. But there's another group, and this is what Galatians is talking about. You'll, and you'll see it the next two weeks when we finish up to this. The book of Galatians is all about these people confusing works with grace. Confusing the law with faith. And what we're looking at here is a very simple, simple statement. The just shall live by faith. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. And we're going to look at these next two verses and we'll close here. Chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently been, evident, been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now, notice this. It's a who. There's a who that's a problem. Somebody gave you a book. Somebody said, hey, check this guy out on this website. Listen to this guy's sermon online. There is a who that gets us corrupt in our doctrine. And I say it over and over and over. Be careful what you read. Be careful what you listen to. Um, I like what Clyde and Michelle Deskin, they were doing a, a session at our Sunday school clinic on uh, Friday and Saturday. And Clyde said, we just made a decision a long time ago. All the music in our house and in our cars comes from that little room right over there. He said, we're always safe when we do that. We're just, we just decided who is going to influence us. We're going to make sure the right people are influencing our music, our books, our philosophies, and our values. And there in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, Who hath bewitched you? Notice this. When you start as a child of God, trusting Jesus as Savior, and you reach over and you begin to start putting works in with your faith, God says it's just like being bewitched. It's demonic. It's witchcraft. You don't mix these two. That is a demonic thing. If you remember, we were back over in chapter 1, Paul said, whoever brings another gospel, which is not another, let him be anathema maranatha. Let him be cursed. Jesus is coming again. Paul said again in chapter 1, if I or an angel bring any other gospel, let him be accursed. Paul's very strong in this thing. Do not mess with this thing called the gospel of grace. You're saved by faith. And one of the great uh, attacks of Satan is on the word of God. One of the next great attacks of Satan is on the gospel itself. And then you'll find in these cult lessons we've done on Sundays, you'll find the next two, the person of Christ and the person of God. Those four things. That's where you're going to find all your corruption creeping in. Who God is, who Jesus is, how you got saved, and how did you get revelation, or how do you get truth. Pretty soon you get the Pope speaking ex cathedra. I got this straight from God. Oh, garbage. I don't believe you got anything straight from God. The Mormon church teaching that if you were, uh, that the white people are children of Jesus and the black people are children of the devil. And that is Mormon doctrine. You Google it, you'll find 10,000 references to it. It's a fact up until the mid-1900s. And then we got a culture where, where uh, the, uh, the black uh, people are finding themselves in business and education and in sports and movies and in politics. All of a sudden, oh man, we can't have that. So we got a revelation. Now it all changed. Liars, corrupt, lewd, vulgar, let them be a curse, Paul said. I love the fact that you hold in your hands a 1611 book that is true to what was written the 1600 years before it was put in our English language. And that's why the devil wants to mess with this. That's why we don't want any other versions. That's why we don't want anybody corrupting the word of God. Who hath bewitched you, he says in verse 1, before that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. And we're going to, I'm just going to read this and we'll, we'll, this is where we'll start in next week. This only would I learn of you. Received you the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? How'd you get saved? You get saved because you went to church on the Sabbath? You get saved because you, you didn't eat meat on Friday? You got saved because you counted rosary beads? You got baptized in a Baptist church? Is that how you got saved? How'd you get saved? Well, I got saved by faith. Then stay there. Verse 2. 
Received you the spirit by works of the law, the hearing of faith. Verse 3. Again, he calls him foolish like he did in verse 1. Are you so foolish? And this is the church he started. These are people he preached to, and he got them together and uh, trained these people. And in verse 1, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. In verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you, been, have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he goes on, and we're going to stop there. Let's explain this. On August 28, 1975, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior in a city park, 10 o'clock at night. I was, I was saved. My sins were forgiven. I was washed by the blood of the Lamb, and my home was settled forever in heaven. I want to be good because God is good. But I'm not about to say I'm trying to be good to complete the gospel. If you think me going to church and not smoking cigarettes can add anything to Calvary, we've got a pretty pitiful view of Calvary. If you think not drinking liquor is somehow going to help what Jesus did on the cross, you didn't pay attention to the end of the gospels when Christ was crucified. If you think going to church and giving your money to the poor and being a good husband or good wife somehow puts the icing on the cake and completes the work of grace that was bought and, and paid for by the blood of the Son of God. That's crazy. It's an absolute abomination. Greatest insult you could pay to Jesus is to say, Jesus, I know you saved me, but just to be sure I'm saved, I'm going to add that I'm a tither. Now, I think you ought to tithe. That's on the other side of the cross. You ought to tithe because God's been so good to you. You ought to live a holy life because he's worthy. You ought to love your neighbors yourself because he asked you to. But the idea that I'm going to somehow be good to help get saved? I'll tell you what, I got saved. End of subject. The night I trusted Christ, the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him I was made righteous August 28th 1975 and you can't get any better than that and so were you if you were saved let's pray father bless our evening our night our work tomorrow and school the weekend